okay, well, let's get this show on the road. <laughs> hey, I really, uh, this is my fourth DevOps days. Um, first one in Salt Lake, though, right? Um, so I actually have been involved in the DevOps movement pretty much since close to the inception. I think I attended the, the second DevOps days that was held in Santa Clara. Uh, went a few times there. Um, some fellow colleagues of mine have started DevOps days, participated in starting DevOps days in Austin and in other places. So um, been involved with this really from before it became even really well known as DevOps. Uh, when, we start, when I started to do, get involved in some of the, the practices that we now identify with DevOps. But I want to say that um, the, the first DevOps I attended was in really just like a warehouse. And actually there were two rooms that were one on each side. The screen was in the middle of those two rooms and you really had to kind of stand up and look to just kind of see the presentation. It was very... Uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was just really kind of put together, thrown together. Um, this setting uh, is uh, far and above uh, what that, that first DevOps that I attended was. And uh, that, that's kind of the spirit of DevOps. It's that kind of scrappy, uh, you know, get it done uh, mentality. So uh, this, is, this is an awesome event. And I'm, I'm really privileged to be here. I want to thank Alia and the DevOps Days Salt Lake City program committee for inviting me to speak. My, uh, I, I just want a real quick show of hands. How many of you in here are currently consider, you know, DevOps practitioners? In other words, you are involved in DevOps uh, activities at your current workplace, uh, you know, and, 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 and what you're doing at work? Just raise of hands. Okay, so about two-thirds maybe, three-fourths. How many of you are here to kind of just learn about it, uh, not really doing it, but want to, uh, want to move that direction? Okay, all right, great, the rest. Um, so good, well, this is, this is great. So I, I just joined, about six months ago, I joined a company, um, Advanced MD, um, located here in uh, South Jordan does medical software, a SaaS company, software as a service uh, for doctors. And uh, prior to that, I was at Ancestry.com uh, for about six years, where uh, that's where I first became involved with uh, DevOps and DevOps practices and, and led a transformation there. At Advanced MD, I'm in the process of leading, if you will, in, uh, uh, and supporting uh, when I got there, they were already underway into a DevOps transformation, but supporting and uh, helping to guide an, uh, yet another transformation. So I've, I've seen it now, uh, in the middle of it now, in two uh, different uh, instances. At Ancestry, I was actually involved more on the development side. I was a d director in engineering, and I led engineering teams, and, and I was uh, spearheading agile development and agile adoption, and so I approached it from that direction. At Advanced MD, I'm actually the head of operations, and so I'm actually coming at it from a different side. And so my um, talk today is I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of DevOp, DevOps adoption. And... Um, and what I see uh, in that, um, and, and from those two different perspectives. I can say in both experiences, adopting DevOps is just, it's not easy, okay? And uh, um, you'll, you'll see things like this. I, ho I hope you guys can see, but you'll see um, surveys and, and, and various uh, uh, you know, things on blogs. Uh, uh, this is a survey done by Puppet Labs. Other companies do it, right? The rate of DevOps adoption. And, uh, you know, 63% adopting DevOps. Uh, there, there is, of course, DevOps adoption is on the rise. I mean, that's why this conference is actually happening here in Salt Lake City now, is that it is, it is on the rise and it's picking up. But, um, you know, 75%, this one here, version one, 73% have adopted or plan to adopt DevOps. I'm going to actually kind of call, uh, this is, I think, a little bit hyped, okay? And let me ex describe my experience. Um, I do a little bit of, 
you know, in, in my role in kind of the, the, the experience I have with DevOps and I come in contact with people, they'll say, hey, would you come into my company and just talk to my, talk to our staff about DevOps, what, you know, what to do, what, what your experience, right? Similar to what I'm doing here. Um, in various job interviews that I've had in interviewing for new positions or, in, or looking at new positions, um, it was a little bit surprising as I went into companies um, that my DevOps experience, my experience with DevOps, wasn't really what they were looking for. That was kind of a, a secondary bonus. Um, my other expertise is in cloud development and cloud technologies, and so um, that was really much more of interest uh, to companies. In fact, when I went into companies, uh, they were just, a lot of them, more than I expected, were like, yeah, we're, we're looking at DevOps, or we've, we're thinking about it, but we're not really sure, right, what to do, and, and, uh, and so didn't really, um, I, was, uh, I was surprised that, it, that I really didn't get much more of a strong reaction around it. Um, the interesting thing about DevOps, when, and one of, the, one of the things that, you know, we've heard about with this adoption is there's so many benefits. So one of the things that I was a little bit perplexed about was why aren't people more aggressively adopting? Why aren't these CIOs and CTOs more aggressively adopting it uh, and supporting it, right? There's so many benefits, high-performing IT organizations, experience, there's so many benefits that have been published. Um, Jez Humble and Nicole Forsgren of Chef, um, and Jez Humble, who you know, wrote the Continuous Delivery book, published a peer-reviewed paper talking about and tying DevOps metrics to actual business success and business metrics and to uh, share and market share value and how that actually can increase that. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to DevOps, but I, again, I was a little perplexed as why isn't there you know, really more uh, adoption? Um, so um, the other thing, right, that uh, I think that we understand about DevOps now and also kind of understanding why people aren't adopting is DevOps turns w your IT and your operations group into what I call a strategic asset. In most companies, and I run operations now, uh, especially when you look at, uh, um, when you go to finance or you look at your, your, your bottom line, Operations is, tends to be classified as a cost center, right? It's, a, it's an operating expenditure. Um, they're not viewed as actually, from a financial point of view, adding value to the business. And many businesses are trying to figure out how to actually make operations more efficient. They're actually trying to figure out how to shift resources from operations into development where you can actually create more features. And so the, the general view is that operations is, uh, costs money and that whatever you can do to minimize that is what you should do. DevOps changes that paradigm. DevOps changes IT and operations into what I would call a strategic asset. How does IT and operations enable the business to actually deliver more value and, and gain a competitive advantage uh, over others in, in their same industry or, or, or market space. A being able to deliver software faster, being able to deliver software high quality, deliver much better uptime, all of those things actually enable the business uh, in, in ways that, um, that, that enable them to grow and to uh, go into new markets and do new things that, that, that are otherwise really not possible or would take too long. And so... Um, so again, I'm back to this, like, why is this taking, why is this so difficult? Why is this so hard to adopt? Why is there such a challenge? And as I went into these companies, this is what I learned. I just learned that a lot of CIOs and CTOs just weren't ready. They just didn't know exactly what to do. And so I started to think about this. And by the way, this was interesting. Most of the companies I interviewed with were SaaS companies. They were software as a service. They delivered their product fully on the web. And even they were having struggles with what do we do, how do we adopt it, how do we leverage it? We're not sure what to do. Now, there are many that are doing it, but I was just surprised at, at the number that were really having a challenge, um, even those that I thought were um, 
ready, right? These are the comments, right? We aren't ready for it, okay? Um, we aren't really sure what to do with DevOps. We're, we, we don't even really know what that is exactly. We tried DevOps. We, I even had one. We tried DevOps and it didn't work. So they abandoned it. Um, so, uh, so I started to think about this and um, I'm going to go back with a little bit of a history. I, I want to tell you kind of where this, where I kind of concluded this, uh, this uh, comes from. Um, back in the, uh, in the 70s, IT, 70s is when IT emerged, right? As, as something critical to the business. Businesses, stores, uh, whatever business uh, that was out there began to use IT computers and software to help run their business. Back then, um, if you were a business, you would go out to somebody like IBM or another company like that and you would buy your computers and you'd buy your software, you'd install a solution and you would then you know, operate that. Um, because of that, what happened in the 70s and the 80s became known what is called IT service delivery. Okay? Uh, it's a process around how to deliver IT services. Um, so this discipline was born. Of that discipline out came things like ITIL, okay? Um, or, and then you also have, you know, your vendor solutions. Um, this is where we got the discipline of a sys system administrator, a sysadmin. This was a person that installed and maintained these systems in a business. Uh, and that's, that's what they did, right? And from this whole uh, time period, the 70s and 80s is what, where I would say classic what we think of as classic operations was born, okay? Um, scaling, scaling was mainframes. Scaling was getting more terminals. Scaling, uh, and then later we had networking, like, you know, uh, file sharing. Um, so out of this was born this traditional, uh, if you will, operations. And then finally was created the term, the enterprise. I remember when I went to Ancestry, uh, and I started to work, uh, especially with vendors, right? And, and I came from the development side and I started to interact with vendors a little more and they would say, you're an enterprise. And I'm like, what does that mean exactly? What is an enterprise? What is an enterprise versus, what's a non-enterprise? And uh, what I came to learn over time was that an enterprise reflected a, a, a business that would typically acquire software solutions that would purchase, acquire, and integrate software solutions versus one that would build them. That was typically, right? And so vendors would come in and sell into enterprises. Uh, and there were other characteristics, but that was one of the distinguishing, distinguishing features. So, so there was this notion of an enterprise. Oh, well, obviously 90s and 2000s, the internet came, right? Changed everything rapid delivery, uh, massive scale, right? Google, uh, Facebooks, um, software as a service was born, delivering solutions, right? Uh, uh, via the web uh, as a service. Um, what happened at this point now was I think a fundamental change because of the way software could be delivered. People didn't necessarily have to go, right? Obviously to the brick and mortar store. Companies now, instead of only buying software and integrating software into their company, they would now could develop their own software and deliver their own software. In, case, in many cases, they had to do that. That was required. And, um, and so now enterprises or traditional companies, uh, your classic companies, were now beginning to build software and, and figure out how to deliver that. Um, and so... Um, Recently, we have these terms, maybe you've heard of them, right? But kind of through this whole movement, there's been two kinds of uh, ways of looking at, at, at businesses or, or enterprises that, that utilize IT. We call them horses and unicorns. And they have fundamentally different ways of looking at fact, In fact, hey, here's a unicorn right here, right? So somebody understands uh, this. Um, but, but the difference between the horse and the unicorn is the unicorn came out of a different era and a different mentality. It didn't come out of that traditional enterprise world, 
okay? Um, and then from there, looking at these unicorns, um, came the term what we call web scale IT. This is uh, IT operations and services that are run on a web, large web distributed scale, okay? So think Google, think Facebook, think Netflix, think Amazon, think, right, et cetera. These, these were the models for the unicorns and they were changing how uh, IT was done. They were changing, right? Uh, they, they, they are still changing and they are putting pressure on the traditional IT uh, uh, businesses. And thus, out of this whole movement, right, DevOps and these things were born, and people are now looking at what are those guys doing that we could do? Well, that's essentially what we're calling DevOps. That's what we're calling uh, web scale IT, okay? This is what Gartner says about web scale IT. It is our effort to describe all things happening at large cloud services, service firms like Google, Amazon, Rackspace, Netflix, Facebook, that enables them to achieve extreme levels of service delivery as compared to many of their enterprise counterparts. Notice that Gartner distinguished between web scale firms and enterprise, okay? Whenever you hear the word enterprise, you, you, you equate that with traditional IT operations. That's what that means now, okay? And so the, the, the challenge now is, how do you go from traditional IT operations into web scale or what we're here for, right? DevOps, those are very synonymous. Let me, let me just illustrate this evolution, okay? Traditional enterprise we call a horse. The, the image of the horse is, right, that just, that plodding along, that, that you know, just, just keeps plodding along and just plows through, right? Versus the unicorn, which is that horse that's been sprinkled with some magic pixie dust that is this uh, unique creature, okay? So that's kind of the imagery there. But you have this traditional enterprise horse, right? And as I mentioned, right, because they would acquire software, they did not build it originally, right? These businesses came up um, through, through a different uh, uh, evolution. Um, they started with IT and systems ad system admins, right? System administration, that's what they, they started with. Later, when, they learned, when the web came, they, had to do, they actually acquired development. Now they're actually building software and trying to ship that. But they're doing that in the context of this traditional sysadmin IT mindset, okay? And so um, that then develops into a, an IT operations group because they're delivering a software as a service, but it comes from that, that original mindset, okay? And that, and, that, and that environment Tra versus web scale or what we call a unicorn, right? How did they evolve? If you go back and look and read about Google, look and read about Amazon, read about, right? How did they, how did they evolve and what, what happened with their IT? They took a totally different path. It's not that they didn't have problems. At one point, Amazon was very close back in the early 2000s. Amazon was very close to I don't know about bankruptcy, but they were very close to uh, having some major issues because their, their architecture was not suitable to scale. And they had some real challenges, but the, men, the, the mindset and the mentality at Amazon was completely different than at what you would say as a traditional enterprise, right? But they started from the get-go with development. Their, their world was software from the get-go, and they lived in that world from the, from the start. Therefore, their operations evolved out of a development mentality. And it's very interesting because, well, um, I'll just say, IT and systems admin would come in later as they adopted software in the company just to support the company, like their office, their, their office software, and those kind of things, right? It's more of a help desk function, okay? It's not their operations function. And you can tell this because when you actually go to their web pages and you look at their job descriptions for operations people, they don't use the words system admin, okay? If you've ever gone to Facebook or Netflix, right, right, and you look at what do they call their operations people, they call them engineering operations, 
They call them infrastructure engineering. They call them site reliability engineering. In fact, these are disciplines that were created by these companies. Notice that how the word engineering is embedded in all of those descriptions. The point is that on a web scale company, right, operations takes a much more engineering or if you will, development mindset. This is why I think DevOps is such an appropriate term. Um, DevOps can be a little confusing, but really, if you go back, um, Patrick Dubois, who's the person that coined the word DevOps, in a conversation I had with him, he said, I was a person in operations, and I looked over in development, and I saw what they were doing, and I said, I want to do what they do. And he began to adopt agile practices. He began to adopt um, automation. He began to try to apply much of what he saw in engineering into his operations job. And thus he then coined the term DevOps as he had tried to apply development and engineering principles into his operations work. Okay? Now there's an interesting, I, I, this is a, a, a breakthrough uh, in a way I guess, um, a new term okay, that I came up with. This is what I experienced. Uh, in, and frankly, in both companies I went to, Ancestry and Advanced MD, it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just, it's just the way it is, but, um, but it's, uh, think of it as, a, I, I call it a new term, there's another type, and I call it the worse, okay? <clears throat> and worse means the web horse, okay? How many of you are in a company that is a SaaS or web company that that is how they deliver, that is their business. They're on the web, yet they act like a traditional IT enterprise. I think that is very widespread. I mean, these are companies that came up from the beginning in a very similar way to Google and Amazon, right? Technology, delivering software on the web, but somewhere along the line, they acquired the traditional IT operations mindset. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. Perhaps it was a guy they hired that came from that background and applied what they knew into uh, the new business. I don't know how it happened, but that is that when I went, and this is when kind of the, when the light bulb went off, as I went out and looked, for some reason I, was, I, I interviewed only with software companies, full technology companies. They delivered their software on the web, but yet they were horses at their core. They were traditional IT enterprises still at their core. Okay? They, had not, they had not been able to shift out. So I call this worse, right? Where they, they started in the development mindset, but they still acquire the traditional operations, right? Ultimately, what this brings us to is, my point is that development operations in these companies is like, you know, if you saw the movie Batman v Superman, it's like two different worlds at odds. It's like an epic battle, okay? And um, let, me, let me give an example of this, okay? How many, I call it the DevOps downward spiral, okay? Is, this is a very classic case. I see it over and over. I see it when I go into company. This is actually one of the first questions I ask in the company, right? Who, all you have to say, who is responsible for uptime on your software, on your software service? And if they say operations, you know that this is happening, okay? Right? Well, development is paid to write and ship features, so they do that. Operations is, they're tasked with uptime. They're tasked with keeping it running. They're tasked with 99, right, four nines, five nines, whatever it is. Okay. Development rights and ships features, right? But there's, there's quality issues. It's, nothing's perfect. It doesn't always run. Well, they, if you will, they ship it, if you will, throw it over the wall into operations. Operations operates it, but it doesn't always work. There's problems, there's challenges, nothing, right? You have to scale it. There's all sorts of things happening. That becomes pain and instability to the operations group. The operations group is being tasked with this uptime. And they say, hey, I can't achieve this uptime because you keep throwing stuff over the wall to me that I cannot operate effectively. 
Therefore, what, do I'm going, what am I going to do? I am going to slow you down. Okay, I am going to put change control in place. I'm going to put pro processes in place. I'm going to, you know, all sorts of things that I'm going to do uh, to kind of slow this down so I can actually meet my objective, what I am getting graded on. Well, what does that result in? That results in frustration on the development side. They want, hey, we need to ship more. We need to ship faster. We need to, like, why are you being so, pro you know, why are you being so uh, obstructive? Therefore, shadow IT, shadow operations evolves, right? The credit card comes out and you go to Amazon and the next thing you know, you have security problems. I found out the other day, just at work, that this happened. I don't know what the, bat, right? But somebody set up a server in their basement hosting production uh, services in their basement behind a Comcast router. That is not secure, okay? Um, maybe I shouldn't have said that because uh, like I could maybe get in trouble for that I don't know but anyway the point being is that that's what happens those kind of things happen right because the two are this they're at odds right and it just becomes uh, just uh, very very frustrating and untenable right let me point this out I think this is the point I'm trying to make in a DevOps transformation whenever you take on a DevOps transformation now this is my this is my second time, and so I'm kind of putting this together, right? Maybe this is obvious to you, but it wasn't completely obvious to me. The group that is the most affected by a DevOps transformation is the traditional enterprise operations group, by far. Okay, they are the ones that are the most affected. I'm not saying the development's not affected, but operations is the most affected, and I think that's where the the, the whole movement came from, right? And I'm gonna put it even this way. If you are an operations person in that traditional operations and DevOps is coming toward you, you see an assault, okay? You don't see a challenge, you see an on and outright assault on what you're doing, okay? It is a, in some cases, it is a terrifying thing, okay? And all sorts of things set in. Okay, it's an assault, it's a challenge at best to the conventional IT operations wisdom that, that is out there, okay? Let's take a look at some examples. Let's really see what, when we say DevOps, right, there's some practices that we say are kind of core to DevOps, and let's see who they really affect. Well, infrastructure is code, right? I need to be able to bring up my infrastructure in a consistent way, I wanna express it well, that's obviously operations. They're the ones that control all the infrastructure. In a traditional light, that's where it is. Well, it affects them. Cloud, or I want a cloud-like infrastructure. I want it virtualized. I want, I want things to be able to stand up very quick. Well, that's operations. That's what they have to deal with. Automation, I need more automation. Well, this is a particularly difficult one because a traditional IT enterprise group has typically the sys administrator folk who are not versed in scripting or automation or coding or development. So this already, that right there is kind of a challenge. Okay, monitoring and logging. Well, they've got to, that, they have to do that. Uh, much more monitoring and logging. Rapid deploy and release. Well, they're usually the gate into production. So who, do, who that has to go through them? Somewhere, okay. Continuous delivery. This is kind of the holy grail. This is one of the holy grails of DevOps is if you can get into a continue, a true, continuous delivery model. Um, this does affect both, right? Development needs to change. Both operations and development need to change. So there's, there's both there, but, but definitely operations, right? The, the fact that you're going to deploy into production, right, with no, I mean, obviously if you're doing con true continuous delivery, you have quality gates, and so that should give assurance, right? But that, that initial letting go and being able to trust that process while, while I am getting graded on uptime and is, is very terrifying, okay? Um, testing, that's, that's a development side. Testing is often a challenge, right, with, with DevOps adoption. And security, security, okay? That's typically on the operations side. So the bulk of these, what we'd call classic DevOps practices, the bulk of them affect the operations side. The pressure is on them to make the change, 
okay? A little bit on development, but mostly on operations, okay? Um, Gartner, right, with WebScale IT says, here, here are the elements of a WebScale IT, the, f the top three industrial data centers. Well, that's operations. Web-oriented architectures, that is a development, right? Oftentimes, architecture can be a, a real issue to, to scale and to have web scale uh, to be a unicorn, if you will. But programmable management, that, that's basically fancy word for automation, right? Self-service, cloud, et cetera, okay? Again, an operations thing. So two of the three key things of web scale IT land squarely in the middle of operations, okay? So when you take on a DevOps adoption, you have to understand that it is going to impact your operations group the most. So where do DevOps initiatives generally come from, though? It generally, they generally start on the engineering side, right? Because engineering say, we want to move faster. We want to ship more features. And they'll start, you know, that, this is my experience, right? I mean, it, I'm not saying this is, but my experience is it tends to kind of start on the engineering side and then that pressure starts to mount on operations and then things can go uh, really um, haywire, okay? So let me talk about some challenges. Um, what is my time? I just, what, how much time do I have left? Seven minutes, okay. Well, I think we can get through most of this. And I'm gonna be here all day, so I welcome, well, we won't have time for questions here, but I'm gonna be here. I'm happy to talk with anybody's challenges. Let's go through a couple of these. One, this is probably, we've, many people have talked about DevOps as culture, okay? So understanding that operations is on in an assault, right? What, what, are, what can you do, right, about these things? One is educate on the agile and lean mindset. Most operations people, you're over there in your scrums and you're doing your scrums and developments, and you're, you're all doing that. They're, they're not included. Typically, they're not included. They don't know what is going on, right? In fact, my guys aren't included until they want to go to production. Hey, I think we should call you guys now because we'd like to go into production. You know, that's way too late, okay? But getting them to understand the agile, lean mindset, understanding about flow, value creation, right, gets them to, gets them to understand, right, the bigger picture, the cultural element, right, of what really trying to happen. Okay, um, another challenge. Unilateral executive, right, it coming down completely from on high, like me as an executive saying, okay, we are going to do DevOps, that's it, and this is, you know, um, the other flip side would be a completely grassroots effort coming from bottom up. The bottom line is that I can just tell you if you don't understand this about management, right? All us pointy haired, uh, uh, pointy haired guys is that um, if we don't have buy-in, it, 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 it will die, okay? Eventually it will die. Um, we, can, we can, it's not that we overtly go about it, but we'll subconsciously or just by not paying attention or by not resourcing it, we'll, we'll, we'll slowly kill it off, okay? And it just may be just we don't pay attention to it. So a grassroots is important, but you must have executive sponsorship. <clears throat> so it has to be, you've got to have both sides coming together or it's not going to happen. <clears throat> Understand next that DevOps is a capability spectrum. What I mean by that is that we say DevOps, but there's no one picture of exactly what, what is a true DevOps, right? Um, some people will say, oh, well, my engineers are doing all the, uh, my, the engineers themselves do the operation. If you go to Amazon, the saying there is you build it, you run it, which means that the engineers are also operating. That, and, and Netflix is, is similar. I mean, it's not, now Google is a little bit different. They're, they're one of the unicorns, but they don't quite act that way. They actually have a, they have what they call site reliability engineers, as I mentioned. They will actually take the software and they'll operate it. They don't expect the engineers to operate that full time. They do have what they call a handbag, and I actually mentioned that later, right? But they have, if, this, if the system becomes out of operational compliance, they will then hand it back to engineering and say, you get to operate it until you get it under control, okay? 
So, um, but there's a spectrum of DevOps, right? There's participatory deployment, there's uh, self-deployment, there's, there's just a whole spectrum of what you can, and, and sometimes I think we get caught up into, well, I have to be all the way over here, I have to be like just full DevOps, right, for this to be successful. That's not true. You can build up uh, and, and, and mature, if you will, slowly, okay? Um, technology, right? Innovations, physical, etc. Okay, I'll try to. This is one of my big pet peeves. Big, big. DevOps. I think Alia kind of alluded to this. DevOps is not a team. One of the worst things you can do is call a team in your organization the DevOps team. I understand the the, the desire to do that because you want to identify that you actually have a DevOps. Um, effort going on in the company and that's a way to identify it but what it does is that it puts in the mind of everyone else in the business engineering and operations included that DevOps is that that DevOps only exists there and if by the way if DevOps isn't in operations you have not succeeded because we already established that operations is the one that's going to be the most effective if you set up a DevOps team over here You've just now excluded the very the people you most need to have involved in the transformation. So if you need tools, you need teams to do these things, call them the continuous delivery tools team, the build tools team, the whatever, right? Call them that. Let DevOps live across the organization. Okay, three. Uptime, I already mentioned this. Make uptime and performance a shared metric across the organization, not just operations. Everyone responsible for it. And you can institute a handback. If you're not ready to actually have engineers operate fully, have them institute a handback. Say, you know what? This is not running well. You get to help us operate it. Uh, this is a big one, right? This is a development one. Unsuitable application architecture. Most people can't really achieve the full capability of DevOps until they get their application architecture into a state like modular decoupled microservices that's in, that's in, uh, largely on the engineering side uh, uh, leave monolithic technology choices right go to different uh, so that that's an engineering effort continuous delivery this is such a bad misconception continuous delivery does not mean automated deployment okay you've got to understand what real can people say I do continuous delivery what does that mean well we ship to the website well the shipping to the website is not continuous delivery. That's just deploying. Continuous delivery means I've set up a complete pipeline that vets quality all the way up. I just read the book, Continuous Delivery, and uh, um, this is one of Jez Humble's big, biggest pet peeves, too. Testing is a bottleneck. This is another, right? How do you deliver faster? Testing. Manual testing is not the answer. You have to understand how to evolve into some more automated testing. 90% of your test coverage should be automated. If it's the other way around, you're always going to be bottlenecked. Lastly, non-agile infrastructure. Adopt cloud-like technologies, virtualize, private cloud. This will also accelerate, right? And this is an area where your operations group can help. Lastly, don't forget about security. Security is another area that typically is left out of this equation. That is the end. Thank you.